Welcome to the More Perfect Union, a podcast about the joy we get from the American politics, or as we call it, real debate without the hate. I'm Greg Matuzak, your liberal Democrat from Cincinnati, Ohio. This is Emily Brewer, your moderate Republican from Virginia. And I'm Kevin Kelton, your moderate Democrat from Los Angeles, California. And I'm DJ McGuire, your neoconservative libertarian from Suffolk, Virginia. A more perfect union can be found on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and on Facebook at facebook.com backslash more perfect union podcast. Phew. And please share our link on Facebook news feeds and ask your friends to give us a listen because, well, that would be awesome. How are you all? This has been quite a week. It just doesn't stop, does it? It's it's amazing. It's every week Donald Trump has the worst week ever in the history of politics. He's like he's like the Lou Gehrig of politics. Oh wow, too soon. <laughs> I, I too was going to say the cockroach actually because it seems like he you know it he just keeps on having another life. He just can't kill him, right? That's true. We have said this before. Every week is the worst week for for Trump and yet He's still there. He's still there. This week, in in addition to some of the things we're going to talk about, the now he's declaring war on his own party. But that's not actually the first thing we're going to talk about. The first thing is, uh, last Friday we talked about this, the tape, the tape, that really hurt his campaign. The Billy Bush tape. The Billy Bush tape, right. And now, to accompany that, many women, binders of women, have actually come <laughs> forward Binders. I think that's a Republican term. I'm no, not sure. I figured out. Up- As of yep. this taping, I think we're up to about eight or nine or maybe even ten accusers. Uh, that may change in the coming days. But uh, there does seem to be a, no pun intended, body of people coming forward to claim that these uh, accusations about Trump's behavior are indeed real. You you know what I got, guys? What I really worry about with all these sexual assault claims on a larger scale is I really really worry about what this is going to do for average folks that want to report sexual assault or uh, domestic assault or things of this nature because I I'm afraid they may not be taken seriously because of the way that uh, voters have just demoralized some of these uh, accusers. Well, that's always a, that's always a problem in these situations. It was a problem with the Bill Cosby situation in the early days when before there was so many people that they had to be taken seriously. Uh, it's it's a problem generally, and you're right. Whenever these things happen, my hope is that we move forward and it sheds more consciousness on the fact that this does happen. It's not always a, a pattern that we understand. You know, everybody says, well, why would they wait 20 or 30 years to come forward with this? Well, because 30 years ago, it was very, very dicey for a woman to claim that a powerful man had harassed her, especially with no proof. Uh, The reason that they're coming forward now is because they see that this man could be the next president of the United States, and they believe that it's their moral obligation to speak up and do something. Right. I'm seeing – there's there's a lot of people I'm seeing who are getting – I don't want to say the reception it deserves, but actually it is where – it's it should like we should investigate these things. These women, if are not being you know, yes, there is a group that is immediately dismissing it, but there is a large group that's saying, wait, this happened to me too. We've had similar experiences. There's a good chance this could be true. We believe you. I just want to point out, it's not all bad news for Donald Trump. First of all, I understand he's polling at 84 percent now in France. <laughs> I would humbly submit that I'm not sure that is fair to the French people who are <laughs> who in the 21st century are becoming less enamored <laughs> with that sort of thing than they were in the 20th. I don't know. Okay. It's just well, a joke, guys. You, you it's certainly just a joke. <laughs> I think the, the keystone of this whole thing in terms of whether you should believe Trump or his accusers is in the person who is actually defending Trump, a fellow named Anthony Gilbethorpe who came out this uh, Friday, I think it was, or maybe it was Saturday, and said, oh, no, I was on that plane, and he didn't do anything like that woman said he did. Anthony Gilbethorpe is already well-known in Britain as the man who claimed to, at 17 years old, have run a pedophile ring for high-ranking members of Margaret Thatcher's government. 
I think it's pretty clear that he decided he needed another meal ticket, and he figured out, oh, you American rooms have no idea how much I, I completely lied through my teeth in Great Britain. Here we are. But at the end of the day, we have to say, Donald Trump's defender, the person who, the, the witness that he claims absolves him, is someone who purports to be a pedophilic pimp. Let's just leave that here and move on. Well, okay, I'm actually not going to move on because I also want to point out, even if that wasn't his background, which it is, when somebody says, I sat next to Donald Trump on an airplane 25, 30 years ago, and he did this to me, you can say, well, if that happened, I believe that person would remember it. That's a memorable thing in someone's life. But for someone to say, I flew on a plane 30 years ago, I remember Donald Trump being on the plane too, sitting fairly close to me, sitting next to a woman, and nothing happened. How does he know that's the flight? Because I see famous people and have seen famous people all of my life. I couldn't tell you who they were sitting with or talking to. So the idea that he could identify this woman from a photograph and say, oh, yes, that's the woman that I know I was sitting next to with Donald Trump on this flight. And I can't tell you what day or month or year it was, but I know it was about 30 years ago. It's preposterous. So, I mean, do any of us buy – let's – Let's kind of go to a 10,000-foot view here. I can't believe there's anyone on this podcast that thinks that there's any credence to Trump's defense. I mean, I think we're all in agreement that he probably did the things that he's accused of. Anybody disagree? I didn't think so. No, no. I mean, he, he, I mean, he, he, he says, he says he does the things. He's, he's been saying for years on the Howard Stern okay. show— um, the Billy Bush okay. tape on everything he says. This okay. is how he acts. Okay, so, so why is anyone surprised? Okay, so then yeah. we have an election where we have a man who everyone acknowledges is a sexual predator of some kind. He's running for president against a woman that a lot of people don't trust, don't like, don't want to be president. And a choice has to be made. And, and I don't know why we can't just get to that point and say, look, Donald Trump is who he is. You knew when he was running in the primaries who he is. If you're going to vote for him, fine. But let's not play the game that he's not a sexual predator. Let's just acknowledge it. Bill Clinton is a sexual predator. Let's acknowledge that too. And let's just decide, are we going to vote for the sexual predator because we don't like trade deals and we don't trust Hillary Clinton and we don't want liberal social policies and we don't want a liberal Supreme Court justice? Are we going to forget all of that or use all of that to rationalize putting a man in office who does not have the moral character to be president. If that's a choice you want to make, that's your vote. It's up to you. But just know that's what you're saying. Let's not play any game or pretend that he has any morality because he doesn't. Okay. Very well. Okay. Okay. Look, it, Greg. I, should re- I should remind people that you don't actually have to vote for either of these two. Well, I thought I thought we lived we, in a two-party system. Yeah, that's, who else is running? DJ? There's nobody else running. There's no one else running, is there? <laughs> we, 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 we have a candidate on the ballot in every single state of the union in the District of Columbia. That candidate is actually – Jill Stein? That <laughs> a, funny. She's not on the ballot in every state. The candidate, Gary Johnson, my choice, is actually ahead of Donald Trump among voters under 40 in Alaska. He's ahead of Donald Trump among voters under 35 here in this state where I live, the Commonwealth of Virginia. He is within 10 points of Hillary Clinton and within a few points of Donald Trump in New Mexico under the last poll. So there is an alternative to either of these two. If you do not want and to I'm vote for— And I'm going to be the deflator. If you, if you do not want to vote for and <laughs> acknowledge to a boasting sexual predator, and if you do not want to vote for someone who was part of the Arkansas political machine that at the very least— led the taxpayer 50 million dry over Madison Guarantee and has been involved in numerous policy mistakes for the last 20 odd years and actually walked away from the one decent thing she did, which was support the liberation of Iraq from Saddam Hussein. You don't have to vote for either of them. That's all. All right. Let me, since, does, since, does, since anybody, does anybody think that Gary Johnson's going to crack 5%? Uh, no. Yes. Uh, I think he could get no. 6 or 7 I, I, I don't. I'm not of sure now. of it, but I think he could. I am. I am. Emily, absolutely, I'm, with you. I'm absolutely convinced of it now. 
I think that it's going to be the year for the big seven for the libertarians, but they're not cracking 10. So we still have a two party system, DJ. Yes. Uh, Agreed. Real quick. For Evan, now. Uh, DJ, what about the name Evan McMullen? How do we all feel about this Ooh. Ooh. around the table? I, I am actually glad you mentioned that because we would have to bring him up at some point. He's doing very well in Utah. I was going to bring him up in December, but <laughs> in the, funny. He actually has about four, he's got about four percent in the in the poll in Virginia that we just saw from Christopher Newport University, which doesn't really mean a whole lot. But I think in the places where he's on the ballot, and he is actually only in the ballot in eleven states, but where he is on the ballot, he will easily beat Jill Stein. He'll knock Jill Stein in a fifth. In place that in Utah, for example, which is his home state, uh, he he'll he'll probably knock Johnson into third, maybe even knock Clinton into second. But he is he is clearly a repository, a parking spot for conservative Republicans who are not willing to go to the libertarians, as I have done, but who really do not want to vote for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. He is there. Um, he could have a he could have a role to play. The interesting thing here is I am one of those who's convinced that Donald Trump's staying on the Republican Party is going to last long past November. The question is going to be what sort of alternative is there for center-right voters? Is it going to be Gary Johnson? Is it going to be the Libertarians or is it going to be the Evan McMullen group? My concern is the Evan McMullen group see, the Evan McMullen group really just seem just seem to think that all the GOP needs is is to forget about Trump and come up with a new paint job and everything is fine. I think the problem with Republicans is far deeper. I think the rot is much deeper. That's why I went to Gary Johnson's, why I went to the Libertarians, because, yes, the Libertarians are not going to replace the Republican Party as the center right party this year. It's going to take some time. There are going to be some steps to be done, and they may not ever do it. But this is the first step, getting over 5 percent, getting to set, getting to seven or eight or maybe even 10 percent. That's the first step, getting acknowledged and getting seen nationwide. Then the next step is making the builds and the in the uh, off-year elections. I don't know if they can do that. We'll have to see. Emily, what do you think of Evan McMullen? Uh, who? No, I'm kidding. I've heard about the guy. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't even take him seriously. I mean, I put him below Jill Stein in my really? thought process. That's, I, I really that's, do. That's awesome. Uh, that's interesting, I mean. Uh, I kind well, of he is on the ballot in fewer it, states. It, yeah, I agree he, with he's you. He's on the ballot in fewer states. So from a national I mean, perspective, he's right. Is he on the ballot in Virginia? Right. Because I'm not aware. Yes, he is. He is on the ballot in Virginia. Wow. wow. Well, I already voted, and I skimmed right past that name. So I'll say this. I've never heard one person mention his name. I've seen some Facebook posts. I don't see any activity for him. I will say this, though, is that, you know, I've been working on the ground all weekend at a local fair we have here. And um, I didn't see one thing for Johnson Weld, but I, I met a lot of college students that are going the Johnson Weld route. And a lot of college students that were Democrats, that were, you know, huge Obama supporters that are going to Johnson Weld, which I think is very interesting, and some Republicans. So I think the millennial subset would probably be some of the folks that may support uh, Evan McMullen. Some of the YRs, I think, in Virginia are going in that direction. Uh, but, but by and large, I think those folks are going to Johnson Weld. No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I don't see you, what you know what I think we're we're gonna we're really gonna be able to tell, especially because a lot of shifts are happening right now within the campaigns. They're moving staff and folks to the states that they you know they need to focus on. So the battleground states are really, really coming into play, which I'm hearing some really weird things out there. I don't know if you guys are. Like what? We have. That's an excellent segue, oh, yeah. Emily. An excellent segue to the deep battle- red Arizona. To, oh <laughs> yes, to the, to, to the battle. Oh, oh, oh. You know, I will have to say this: Donald Trump said that if he got nominated, and and all of his defenders and enablers within during primary season, which was not did not include Emily, they said that if Trump is nominated, he would expand the map. He would bring new swing states into play, and he has for the traditional Democrats. Republican states like Georgia. Like Arizona, they're in play now. Hey, um, right, Arizona right now is only up for Trump by one point or two for Clinton by the Emerson survey, but on average, it's one point by real, real clear. That's crazy talk. Yes, and you've got that two is- senators in Arizona who have disavowed him. So John McCain is running without having now officially endorsed him. 
and the other senator, um, who I'm blanking on Jeff his name, Blake. he he disavowed him a long time ago. So I think Arizona is very much in play. I do too. Right. I think Arizona is far more in play than Georgia. Than the Georgia, yeah. I think. I don't think I don't think Georgia's demographics are quite there to make it competitive for Clinton this time, um, but I think Arizona. I mean, Bill Clinton carried Arizona twenty years ago. It is a state whose Republican Party is much more like Jeff Flake, much more of the libertarian, small L libertarian, economic conservative mode, and Trump just turns all of them off. Uh, so I think well, there is a very there is a very good chance that Arizona could go to the Democrats. And if here's the thing, the fact that we're talking about Arizona as a battleground state essentially means Florida's gone. It means North Carolina is gone. It means Colorado is gone. It means Ohio. I agree. Oh, I, I, it means Ohio may be gone. It means yeah, Iowa. I don't gone. know about Ohio. Um, the uh, simple fact of the matter say, is. Emily? No, I, I just, the last thing I'll say. I, 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 I think Florida's locked for Trump. <laughs> no. N-O. Really based on know. what? Based okay. on what? Did you see the registration, the new voter registration numbers? 540,000 new voter registrations for the Democrats, 60,000 new voter registrations for the Republicans in the state of Florida. Oh, dear God. Yeah, no. Yeah. Florida, oh, yeah. dear God. You, yeah, you lost, yeah. You, well, you lost and Florida. And North Carolina is now. definitely in play. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I have heard, if you saw the Post article, Virginia's skeleton crew has all but moved yes. to Carolina. He's, he's pulled yes. out of Virginia. So he's playing in four states right now. I'm going to read them to you because I wrote this down. He's playing in Pennsylvania, Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio. Those are the four states that the Trump campaign has said they are going to focus on for the rest of the campaign. So where do yeah. you think he's campaigning in the next two days? Wisconsin and Colorado. So this is how this is how dysfunctional they are. They have cited four must-win states that they are putting all of their resources and all of their attention in. But he's in two different states that are going solid blue. Of course they are because yeah. he, because he has, he's he, behind he's behind in Wisconsin by nine points, and he's behind in uh, Wisconsin by seven, and in Pennsylvania he's behind in what six points? I I, I will uh, say seven. this. Excuse me. Uh, I, I will say I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Donald Trump will not win Pennsylvania because every Republican gets tempted by Pennsylvania and then it goes to the Democrats. Donald Trump will not win North Carolina because the revulsion over HB2 will hit the entire Republican ticket. Trump will lose. Burr will lose. McCrory will lose. The Charlotte Observer chose not to endorse McCrory for the first time in 25 years. The guy was mayor of their city. <laughs> And they actually, and and they, they they just basically said, we don't know who the hell you are anymore, pal. So sorry, Donald Trump will not win Florida. Uh, he he just won't. I'm sorry. Well, then this election sorry, is Emily. over. I mean, I he's think not we're winning all Florida. There's there's Donald yes. Trump is not going to be the next president how, of the United how, States. How and how long have I told you that? Well, how often did I tell you that in September? Wait, 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 wait. I'm going. <laughs> I wasn't panicking. People, people, don't, don't forget to vote. Though that's the one thing that could that Trump could win is low voter turnout. Though, well, yes, they are. No, yes. he I, can't I, win. I, I, he can't I, I win. Am this I am idea. assuming that I am assuming that people will actually do their duty and go and vote. This notion yeah. that a lead in the polls leads to people not showing up and oops, surprise, the guy who's behind wins. This comes from the California election of 1982. The, it's, called, it's called the Bradley effect. Right. And this is correct. The idea, yeah, and what people, what, and, and for whatever reason, people send the, oh, well, it's because the polls show Bradley was ahead, so all of his voters didn't show up. No. The simple fact of the matter is, because we saw this in Virginia in 1989 when Doug Wilder ran, mm -hmm. back in that era, African-American candidates did better at the polls than they did on Election Day because people didn't want to acknowledge that they were racist enough to vote against a black candidate. That's what hurt Bradley. That's what hurt Wilder. It wasn't the notion of people saying, oh, well, our guy's already won, so I don't have to vote. No, that doesn't happen. The Bradley effect is a myth. Bradley lost despite being ahead in the polls because, unfortunately, white Californians in 1982 didn't want to vote for a black candidate for governor and weren't willing to tell that to a pollster. That's, That's why Bradley lost. That's correct. So this, so let let so let let's yes, P 
people have to go out and vote. But the notion that people will stop voting because the polls say that the race is already over, that just doesn't happen. It doesn't people happen. vote because they vote. And, and, and on top of that, <laughs> generally speaking, in, in a good election, you have people who are enthusiastic about voting for a candidate. That's the ideal. We're not there this year. I happen to be enthusiastic right. about voting for Hillary Clinton, but I will acknowledge there are many Democrats who probably aren't. It's more like she's the person that got the nomination, therefore she's the person that's going to get my vote. But the, the antipathy, the revulsion, the disgust for Donald Trump will drive turnout. If you think yeah, don't don't that, sugarcoat it, Captain. If what you, do you think really that think? after the last two weeks that we've had and the three weeks that we're going to have right now, where he's gone bonkers, this man is just—he's literally insane. If you think that people are going to watch all of that and go, you know, it's not worth my time. It's a beautiful Tuesday, and whatever happens, happens. Believe me, Hillary Clinton will get enough votes to carry the states that she needs to have a very solid victory. Probably a blowout. But at worst, a solid victory. Ohio was close. I'm going to say, speak from what I know. He, he could take Ohio. Ohio is going to be close. That's okay. That's a state, but it's not going to give it's him a, the presidency. It, it, Hill, the Hill, state. Hill, Hill, no, it's Hillary not the Clinton state. Know how. It was and, the state about. Wait a second. Uh, it was the state about eight to twelve no. years ago. It's not the state anymore. What? Yeah, it's oh, the state, state now. As someone who lives in Ohio, I know <laughs> it's the most important state in the union. <laughs> The other thing we need to keep in mind, I'm actually, I've, I'm actually hoping that if Donald Trump loses, and I'm pretty sure he will, I'm still hoping that Trump carries Iowa. And the reason I'm hoping Trump carries Iowa is because I, th I think, I hope that if Trump carries Iowa, then Democrats will stop paying attention to that state. It has two Republican, it has a Republican governor, it has two Republican senators, it has a largely Republican congressional delegation, but it has relatively been a more Democratic state than the rest of the union. When George W. Bush carried it in 2004, it was a surprise. Obama has carried it twice. If Donald Trump carries Iowa, then that tells Democrats, okay, Iowa is not part of our coalition, this majority coalition that, that we just used to win the election. We don't need to listen to big corn screaming about ethanol subsidies and ethanol regulations. We can actually get rid of all that nonsense, and it won't really cost us anything because there are no Democrats at the federal level in Iowa that we need to care about, and they don't vote for us in presidential elections anymore. So I think if you know if, if Hillary Clinton has to win, and I think it's pretty clear she will win, I would rather hope that she loses Iowa because then the Democratic Party at least – can say, hey, we can free ourselves from the shackles of big corn and actually get rid of all this ethanol stuff. And maybe, just maybe, we can get rid of some of this idiotic pitch for corporatism and agriculture and get to a more free market farming system. Well, it's funny you should bring up Iowa because uh, earlier in the uh, in the election cycle, before the Iowa caucus, we had a guest on the show. Her name is Ann Paul. She lives in Iowa, and she gave us the lay of the land and how she thought the Iowa caucus was going to turn out for the various candidates. Um, well, earlier this week, I spoke to Ann and asked her what things were looking like now that it's down to uh, Trump versus Clinton versus Johnson versus Jill Stein. And she was very kind enough to talk to us and tell us what she's seeing on the ground in Iowa three weeks before the election. Hi, I'm talking to Ann Paul, an actress and independent film producer and writer. She lives in Iowa and uh, has been on the show before during the summer. I think it was either before the Iowa primary or right after. Right, we, right before we were voting. Uh-huh. Right. And we talked about where the campaign was then. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about where the campaign is in Iowa now in October. Before I get into that, I want to mention that Anne is a wonderful actress. I've had the... Um, the privilege of working with her in a scene on screen. And she also is the star of a movie that's uh, just come out called Psycho Magnet, which actually premiered recently at the Fangoria Fear Con in Phoenix, Arizona. That's a hard sentence to say. And uh, your <laughs> film your film won the audience favorite. So congratulations. Thank you so much. We had some stiff competition, so we were delighted. That's great. But let's get to the topic at hand today, which is how the Clinton versus Trump presidential campaign is playing in Iowa. So tell me what you're seeing, eyes on the ground. Tell me where you think the state is in terms of the people you know and what you're seeing. Well, sadly, um, compared to where it was the last time I talked to you, I, I think some of the excitement has dwindled. 
want to say that people know who they're going to vote for and are very proud of who they're going to vote for, but it has definitely become a lesser of two evils here. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of sad that that's the way that our system is at times. Now, anecdotally, I've heard that there's uh, lots of Trump yard signs, not as many Clinton yard signs in places like Iowa. Are you seeing that as well? Where I'm at, there really aren't many signs at all. (laughs) Compared to previous elections, there were bumper stickers, signs, all kinds of promotionals, and this year, hardly any. And you're in Davenport, Iowa, right? Just north of there, yeah. yeah. Okay. So in the polling that we're seeing online, Iowa was leaning very heavily Trump, and maybe in the last week, it either has become even or maybe even tipped slightly towards Hillary. Anecdotally, do you have any sense of of that? Do you have any sense of if there's movement, if there's a wave? The enthusiasm, I think, is going to be a big factor, whether people really get out and vote when it comes to voting day. But besides that, um, it's just people that aren't happy and voicing their displeasure. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, they say that nationally people are being turned off by the tone and tenor of this campaign. I would imagine that in Mm -hmm. Iowa, that's even a bigger issue because Iowa is known for not having patience for very negative, very nasty campaigning, right? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that statement. I think Mm -hmm. if you were on either one of the coasts, they'd entertain it a little bit and Mm -hmm. it'd be more fun to uh, debate. But in Iowa, they they aren't even going there. Um, The last rally I went to was uh, Joni's Ride and Roast. (laughs) That was really interesting to get to see Trump trying to bring the enthusiasm. He had a ton of Iowa politicians lined up, Mm -hmm. starting with the ladies. Mm -hmm. And I think he was strategically bringing it at that time. But since he definitely got derailed and it'll just be a matter of whether he gets back on those tracks or whether that train continues off the path. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Ann Paul. And for our listeners, uh, if you're into horror movies, which is the genre that Ann seems to enjoy the most, uh, look for Psycho (laughs) Magnet at your local independent film festival. And Ann, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's been a lot of fun. So let's talk about the debate that we have coming up on Wednesday night. Uh, It's the third Uh. and last debate, if it happens. So let's go around the table, starting with our friend Emily, who we haven't given much chance to talk to tonight. Um, Emily, what are you looking for in the third and final debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? I want to hear substantive policy questions. I mean, deep questions. You know, we're not we're not talking about major issues. And I don't know where debates have gone off the rails the past, you know, couple of years, but we need to get back to the real issues. I mean, we have things going on with Russia. We, we've got ship off the coast of Yemen getting shot at three times. I mean, we have major issues. I don't care about her damn emails. Everyone needs to get past his stuff. If they're going to forgive, forget whatever it may be. I don't know. But I don't care about their personal issues. I want to know what they're going to do for the American people. Period. Well said. You, you know, we've had two we've had two um, debates already where climate change hasn't been brought up once. You know, and there have been there was just an accord signed that was pretty historic um, dealing with climate change, and I would like to hear that brought up. I would like to see that. Um, will that happen? Probably not. Um, I would love, like Emily said, I would like some real meat and bones on this one. I would like to hear numbers. I'd like to hear facts. Um, I would love to have a fact check at the bottom saying, no, the crime rate did not go down or no, the GDP did not go down, but they won't. Um, so it looks like I'm just going to make debate nachos and be disappointed. (laughs) DJ, what are you looking for? I am hoping to get some clarification from Mrs. Clinton on Syria. She sounded much, much tougher on the Assad regime in the second debate. And frankly, that encouraged me. Um, but I'm curious to see if she has thought through the implications of what she said Is she looking to get rid of the Assad regime, which was Obama administration policy? Now, it's not really Obama administration policy. It's a bit of a mess. 
I'm not so concerned. I mean, about the other issues, granted, I've, you know, I think a lot of voters would be curious, w- would like to see discussion on the other issues. Um, I think for the most part, Mrs. Clinton will be very detailed and she'll have very detailed evidence for what I think are the incorrect decisions, while Donald Trump will have absolutely no evidence for whatever the heck flies into his head. But on particularly on the Syria one, I'm very curious, but that's just because I'm one of the last six people on earth who thinks liberating Iraq from Saddam Hussein was a good idea. And I'm just very curious as to see whether she still thinks moving towards democratization in the Middle East is the right thing to do. So that's the one thing that I'm particularly curious about. Uh, I don't think I'll get an answer because I think she'll largely just play out the clock. One thing I am guaranteed, one thing I am, I am saying that I guarantee uh, uh, will not happen is there will be no drug tests before the last debate on Wednesday. <laughs> okay. And I give you guys credit because you all gave very substantive answers about policy issues that you would like to hear brought up. Uh, I think that uh, you're being very optimistic. I think it's going to be a spectacle. I think Donald Trump is going to come out. I wouldn't put it past him, by the way, to come on stage with his drug test and hold it up to Hillary Clinton and say, here is proof that I passed a drug test this morning. I would wonder if you will take a drug test before the end of the campaign. I wouldn't be surprised if Donald Trump, because this is a man who is knows he's going to lose the presidency, knows he's going to be embarrassed to all hell, and he is going to be fighting for his basically for his legacy. I think the man is going to come out and turn it into a circus. I think he's going to take one of his questions, short shrift the answer, and then turn to Hillary Clinton and say, by the way, how do you feel about the fact that your husband is a rapist? Nothing? Okay, Uh. that's what I thought. Well, then let me ask you this. How do you feel about the fact that you you destroyed 30,000, 35,000, 3,000 emails against a a, a subpoena and you've uh, violated the law and you should be in jail. How do you feel about that? And he'll just stare at her and he'll go, yeah, I thought you'd say nothing. Well, how do you feel about this? I think we're going to see something that we have never seen before. I hope I'm wrong. This is one of those predictions that I will say, I hope I'm wrong. But I think that by Thursday morning, it's going to be a very different landscape, not in his favor, but I think that uh, he will have another one of the worst weeks ever. And so with okay, that, well, <laughs> and that happy note, <laughs> and on that happy note, so please check out our website at moreperfectunionpodcast.com where you can also find our blogs and bios and don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. And if you've enjoyed <laughs> this fun little uh, tea party that we've had here tonight and would like to discuss politics with us online, please join us in our online Facebook political group, Open Fire. We're all there, and we'd love to see you there, too. So until next time, thanks for listening, and take care. Now that we're off air, I will tell you what I really think. Um, (laughs)